Welcome friends to our Sabbath School Study Hour here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church where we're going to be starting a brand new lesson today. It's this quarter's brand new lesson. It's called The Great Controversy. And I am so very excited about this lesson because it goes deep into the biblical text. There's so many things that we're going to be learning, so many things that we're going to be studying. So I'd like, like to invite you to take advantage of studying this topic. It's something that will truly set your understanding of God apart. I'd also like to invite you to take advantage of our free offer. It's called The Savior and the Serpent. If you'd like this free offer, you could call the number 866-788-3966 and you could ask for the offer number 798. If you're in the continental North America, you can text SH146 to the number 40544 and you'll be sent a digital download link. Um, if you're outside of continental North America, you could go to study.aftv.org sh146 and you could also get a digital download to this free offer that goes with our, uh, our topic this quarter. Now friends, I am so excited about this study simply because everything that you find in the Bible, the major doctrines, they converge on the topic of the great controversy. Our memory verse this week comes from Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 and 8 that says the following. It says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Now this verse right here, it has to do with the battle that begins in heaven and then it transfers to planet earth. That's what the title of this week's lesson actually is, the war behind all wars. This great massive war that we're all involved in, it started in heaven and then it came to planet earth and that's where we see this memory verse that is about the battle, the fight that happened up in heaven. Now, what we're going to be talking about this whole quarter, essentially, we're going to be going over the major questions that people ask, the major questions of life. Those questions that are such as, if God is so good, why is the world so bad? Or how can a God of love allow so much evil to exist? Or even why do bad things happen to good people? All of these questions, they have to do with the fabric of the great controversy, with the very nature of this battle that we're all emerged in. Now, a while back, I heard um, a really good summary of the Bible, a really good way to sum up the Bible. And I heard this from Pastor David Ashrick. And this is how he put it. He said that if you want to sum the Bible up in three words, you can do so. Those three words are creation, conflict, and covenant. So it's pretty straightforward. The first one is that the God of heaven is the great creator. He's the great maker. And everything that we know, everything that we see, the laws of nature, the material things that we see all around us, they were created by God, right? The wind, the earth, uh, the energy of the world, of the universe, all of that came from God. And especially, specifically, our world created by this divine creator. Now, this creation was then subjected to kidnapping, it was kidnapped and it was then involved in a great, massive, worldwide, universe-wide conflict where planet Earth is at the center stage of the conflict. And you don't have to go very far to see that. I mean, just turn on the news at night or, you know, I hope you wouldn't because it's just bad stuff. But whatever news outlet that you can go to get news from, you'll see that there are wars, there are rumors of wars, there are natural disasters. Our social world is submerged in terror and chaos. Uh, the religious scenario is all also pretty, pretty bad. There's conflict on a macro scale, but not only that, you can see conflict in a micro scale in your own life where we are constantly tempted. We constantly say the things that we shouldn't. We think the things that we shouldn't. So there's this big conflict, this controversy on a big, huge macro scale and also on a micro scale, on an individual scale as well. And then the covenant, the third word right there, it's a little bit more complex because it involves so much. But in essence, this, this covenant is God's plan to deal with the problem of sin. How is God dealing with what happened? He could have done a series of different things, a, a number of different things. He could have turned his back on, the, on the, the world that turned its back to him. He could have just walked away. He could have destroyed it. But contrary to that, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the lamb slain since the foundation of the world. And what that implies is that this plan 
It's always been there. The plan to redeem, the plan to save has always been there. You see, friends, God is a God of unimaginable love. He is a God that is, that is defined by love. It's who he is. It's what he is. His very nature is love, as we see in scripture. All of his actions are based on the foundation of love. His justice is a, a, a side of his love. And so once we understand that about God, it becomes a lot easier to understand what this great controversy is all about and why God does the things that he does. You see, love can never be forced. And that's a big part of this whole conversation. Love cannot be forced. If love were forced, it would not be love. God conceded, he granted to his creation freedom of choice, free will. It cannot be, love cannot be coerced, it cannot, cannot be forced, it cannot be legislated. You see, there's this quote that comes from the book, The Desire of Ages, and it says, only by love is love awakened. Only by love is love awakened. And that has everything to do with what we're going to be talking about. All of this controversy, the war behind all wars, is based on the fact that God granted freedom of choice. And in doing so, he limited his own free will in order to give free will to his created beings. Think about it. If anyone had asked God if he wanted these things to happen, if he wanted the outcome of his creation to be what it was, what do you think he would have said? He would have said, no, absolutely, I don't want these things to happen. And so in order to grant us free will, in a way, God limited his own free will. And I find that a beautiful part of this whole conversation. In any case, Sunday's lesson brings us the title War in Heaven. And that's where all of this begins. This battle, this war behind all wars, it began up in heaven. It didn't start here on planet Earth. But in a way, it happened in the mind of Lucifer. It happened even before we see it on the, the, the biblical stage, the biblical scenario, we know that it started in the mind of one of the most brilliant angels, one of the most brilliant beings that had ever been created. This is known as the mystery of iniquity. We don't really know how it came about in his mind. Think about it. Lucifer had no tempter. There was no devil to tempt the devil. And so how did it arise in his mind? We know that it was pride. It's described in the Bible in two very distinct passages that we're going to read in a few minutes. But how did this happen? There's this quote that comes from the book, uh, The Review and Herald from March 9, 1886. It's more of a, of a periodical. And it says the following. It says, the entrance of sin into heaven cannot be explained. If it were explainable, it would show that there was some reason for sin. But as there was not the least excuse for it, its origin will ever remain shrouded in mystery. And so at least from our perspective, on this side of eternity, we're not going to understand entirely how this originated in the mind of Lucifer, how it began. But what we do know is that this was allowed by free will. It happened by free will. And as I've already said, in granting his creation free will, God, in a way, was opening himself up to this outcome. He was limiting his own free will in order to grant free will. Again, because God would not want any of this to happen. The quotes that I mentioned earlier, the biblical text that I mentioned that revealed to us the mind of Lucifer, at least a snippet of it, of what was happening to him and how this all began in him, they appear in the books of Ezekiel and in the books of Isaiah. The first text here in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12 through 15 says the following, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. I find it extremely interesting that the Bible says that on the day that Lucifer was created, he was granted as sigils of authority, musical instruments. That's, that would be a conversation, a, a completely, entirely different conversation for us. We don't have time to go into it. But think about that, that this being sigil of authority are musical instruments. The text goes on. You are the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You are on the holy mountain of God. You walk back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. And so here we find that he was perfect in his ways from the day that he was created until iniquity was found in him. He was one of the covering cherubs. You remember that when God grants the children of Israel the, the blueprint of the sanctuary, the blueprint of the items that are found inside the sanctuary, there's this one item called the Ark of the Covenant. And on the Ark of the Covenant, there are these two covering angels. One of those angels was Lucifer. He was the covering cherub. 
Now the question would arise, well, who is the other angel that is the covering angel? The Bible doesn't tell us. I don't really like going into any kind of speculation, so we're going to leave it at that. It might have been Gabriel. It might have been some other unnamed angel. In any case, um, Lucifer was one of these covering cherubs. He was perfect in his ways from the day he was created until iniquity was found in him. And then the book of uh, Isaiah completes the picture with uh, Isaiah 14, verse 12 through 14, that says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. That actually is what his name means, son of the morning or son of the morning light. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So here we find Lucifer wanting to be like God. What would possess him to think that he could be like God? Well, therein lies the mystery. He was so close to God, I'm sure that he saw the power, the glory, the majesty of God. At the same time, sometimes you can become blinded by the light. And so by seeing Jesus Christ, by seeing Jesus, the mouth of God, the word of God, John chapter 1 verse 1 through 3 really reveals what Jesus is, who Jesus is. When it says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and everything that was made was made through him. Nothing that was made was made without him. So Jesus is the active agent of creation. He is the manifestation of God's glory to the universe, right? He was the active agent, for example, in the creation of our world. Nothing that was made was made without him. And everything that was made was made through him. And so perhaps by contemplating Jesus, Lucifer then wants to be God. He wants to do the things that Jesus does. And so what we find here is that he is, he is exalting himself and he is saying, I will be like the most high. It's curious that when you analyze, you observe the conversation, the dialogue between the, snir the snake, the serpent, and Eve, the woman, you'll see that that is precisely the same thing that he offers her. He says that God knows that on the day that you eat of the fruit, you will, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Well, where, where did we see that before? We saw that from Lucifer here in Isaiah. He wanted to be like the Most High. Monday's lesson is called Lucifer, uh, Lucifer Deceives, Christ Prevails. And so what we find here is the result of Lucifer's rebellion. It ends in war, division in heaven. We know that Lucifer, he drags along a third of the angels of heaven. The Bible tells us in Revelation 12 verse 4 that his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. And so here we see precisely what happened, what was the outcome of his rebellion. It's a division in heaven, a war in heaven. Whichever way it happened, because we have no idea how this war happened, what it was like. Was it a verbal war? Was it a war of power, of energy? How did this uh, go about? We're going to have to get to heaven to find that out. But whichever way it happened, Lucifer, led by his thoughts, his thoughts of pride and arrogance, of wanting to be like God, he deceived, he lied, and he convinced a third of the angels of heaven to side by him. And this is where our memory verse comes into play that says that war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. We then move on to Tuesday's lesson that has the title, Planet Earth Becomes Involved. You see, this battle that begins in heaven, it, it doesn't end in heaven. Lucifer could have been destroyed right there and then. The Lord could have decided to destroy Lucifer. And that's one of the big questions that many people ask, which is, why didn't God just destroy the enemy right there? I mean, he sinned, he rebelled. Why didn't God destroy him? The truth is that if God had destroyed him right there and then, the rest of the universe would have then wondered what if he was right? What if he had done what was, you know, what if what he was saying was truthful about God, that God is a tyrant and God is a dictator? He, I mean, he destroyed Lucifer as soon as he, uh, he went a different path. And so that's why the Lord allows him to try to implement his governance model. The idea that he was right anywhere else, wherever it could be implanted. That's what happens right there and in that moment. And so the enemy, he is cast out of heaven and he is thrown to planet earth. He comes down to planet earth and he tries to implement his governance model here. And that's precisely what we find in Genesis chapter three with the whole dialogue between Eve and Lucifer. 
the, throughout successive deceptions, throughout successive lies found in Genesis 3, he convinces Eve, and then through extension Adam as well, that God had deceived them, that God had held them back from their true potential. To Eve, the temptation, as I've already said, was to be like God. You find that in chapter 3, verse 5, where it says, For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, of the fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. To Adam, the temptation was different. It was to place his wife above God, doubting God's ability to save her. Now, while their sins were different in kind, at its core was still rebellion against God. And that is precisely how the lesson states it here on Tuesday's lesson when it says, at its very core, sin is rebellion against God. Sin separates us from God. Since God is the source of life, separation from him, from God, leads to death. It also leads to worry, anxiety, sickness, and disease. The suffering in our world is ultimately the result of living in us living on a sin-ravaged planet. This certainly does not mean that every time we suffer, we have sinned, but it does mean that every one of us is affected by living on this planet. And so at its very core is rebellion, and it affects all of us. While it was Adam and Eve that sinned oh so many years ago, it still continues to affect us. We do not inherit their guilt. It's not my fault that Adam and Eve sinned, way back then, but I do inherit the condition, the fallen nature that affects all of us here on planet Earth. It's passed on to me as part of the human family. That's why with this fallen nature, we are born as children of wrath, as we read in the New Testament. But thanks to God, there is a way out. There's a cure to this problem. There is a, a fix, a solution, which is precisely what Jesus, he, um, he offered us. But here I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. In this case, we know that the whole of planet Earth, the whole human family, defected to sin. But on Wednesday's lesson, we see the following. It's called Love Finds a Way. And that's precisely what I've been talking about in the last few minutes. Because this is precisely what we find in Wednesday's lesson, which has the title Love Finds a Way. Which is exactly what I've just stated. God dealing with this situation, dealing with this problem of sin, and this has to do with the third word that I mentioned at the beginning, right? Creation, conflict, and now covenant. God decided to do something about it. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that the consequence of sin is death. It's a very clear consequence. And sure enough, that day that Adam and Eve defected to sin, that day when they decided to rebel against God's governance model and they decided to side by Lucifer's governance model, they introduced sin into the world. That very day, the world began to die. But this did not take God by surprise. This did not take God by surprise. Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 informs us that Jesus was the lamb slain since the foundation of the world. This plan of redemption was there since the very beginning. God had a contingency plan, a plan based on his very character, his very nature. God's character, you see, is one of love. 1 John chapter 4 verse 8 tells us quite clearly that he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And in being love, he reveals it by being the lamb slain since the foundation of the world. He reveals it, the father reveals it, we see it in John 3, 16, that he so loved the world, God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. Who is this text, this text talking about? It's talking about the father. He gave his son out of love, not begrudgingly, he gave him out of love. And so we see the entire Godhead uh, involved in this plan of salvation. And so the Lord establishes his first covenant with humanity, his first contract to save. And this is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, which is, uh, incidentally, the first prophecy that we find in the Bible, which is, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Again, this is the first prophecy of the Bible where God is promising that one day someone would come that would crush the head of the serpent. The one that had deceived the world, that had led the world astray, one day he would be destroyed. And while he would, he would annoy, he would bother everyone, right? He would not uh, go without being punished. He would be crushed. His head would be crushed by the seed of the woman. And by the seed of the woman, we know that that is Jesus Christ. That is one of the big topics that we're going to be studying in our, our lesson this quarter. 
Now, while Adam and Eve didn't fully understand it, the knowledge that the serpent would be crushed, that someday someone would come that would right their wrong, that would fix the problem that they initiated and redeem their descendants from the bondage of death, that must have been a great sigh of relief to Adam and Eve, who at that point were completely frustrated, completely saddened because they saw what their actions had done, what were the consequences of their actions. You see, friends, the love of God is so great that it saw through the horror of sin, the depravity of fallen humanity, the twisted guile of Satan, and it saw a way out. That's why the title of the lesson on Wednesday is Love Finds a Way. Love will always find a way. The Bible tells us that love is stronger than death. And that is precisely what God proved by sending Jesus Christ. He determined that he would come down to this pit with us. That he wouldn't stay up in heaven just telling us how to live. He would come down, come down and show us how to live. Show us the way out. He would provide the way out. Friends, with the hindsight of scripture, we know that it is exactly what Jesus did. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, we read that God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There is the proof right there. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Finally, on Thursday's lesson, we see that Jesus, the way that he does that is by being our high priest. He is our high priest. You see, the whole story doesn't end with the crucifixion. It doesn't end with Jesus' death on the cross. I was talking about that today, actually, with a friend of mine who he is uh, what you would call a pre-Adventist. He's not Adventist yet, but he believes firmly in the Adventist message from what I'm seeing. And so in having this conversation with him, talking about this very topic, I was making it clear that this whole story, it didn't end on the cross, because Jesus resurrected and the Bible does make it clear that he ascended up to heaven, he sat at the right hand of glory, and he intercedes for us as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary today, right? Today he's doing that. Um, the first paragraph here of Thursday's lesson says precisely that. It says, what Jesus did for us on the cross enables him to also intercede for us in heaven. Our resurrected Lord is our great high priest, providing everything we need to be saved and to live in God's kingdom forever. To state it very simply, Jesus presents us before the universe as clothed in his righteousness, saved by his death and redeemed through his blood. Everything we should have been, he was. In Christ, there is no condemnation for the sins of our past. In Christ, our guilt is gone. And through his mighty intercession, the grip of sin on our lives is broken. The chains that bind us are loosed and we are free. That is what we have in Jesus. I love when it says that in Christ there's no condemnation for sins. In Christ our guilt is gone and through his mighty intercession the grip of sins on our life is broken. The chains that bind us are loosed and we are free. Friends, as we begin our study this quarter about this great war, the great controversy, I hope that you understand, that you learn the context behind it, what exactly happened up in heaven, what the Bible indicates that transpires in the beginning of our world and down to the very last days of the history of planet Earth, which I truly and firmly believe that we are living in right now. That one thing remains crystal clear throughout this whole entire study. One thing is the most important thing that we need to understand. And that is revealed in what is perhaps the most famous, the most beloved biblical verse, which is John chapter 3 verse 16. I've already referred to it, but look at what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Again, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whomever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Look, it's very easy to become discouraged in this battle because, because of the fact that we're so entrenched in it, we're so involved, we're so close to the war, it's difficult to sometimes try to see above and beyond it. When we go to work, when we go to school, when we, we wake up in the morning, when we deal with our family, when we deal with our coworkers, when we deal with traffic, all of these things conspire to blind us to the illusion that is all around us, that surrounds us, the illusions of life. But when we stop a little bit to analyze scripture, to study, to be in contact with God, we see that this great battle is much bigger than the people, the flesh and blood that we see in front of us every day. 
This war goes way beyond the politics of government. It goes way beyond the corruption of society. It goes way beyond all of these things because what we do know is that there is a war being fought in the spiritual places and we are involved in this battle. Every day, either by adherence or by contrast, we are siding by the side of light or the side of darkness. This war which is behind all wars is very close. It is very personal to you and to me because we are involved in it in every single shred of life. And so my invitation to you is to become more informed about it, to study your lesson, to study the Bible, to pray, to ask the Lord, beg him to open your eyes so that you can see what is behind the flesh and blood and to see precisely the enemy, the tempter behind the temptation of every day. Fight the battle, be victorious as a Christian soldier, and I'm sure that the Lord will help you every day as you traverse this exodus that we live as human beings. I'd like to invite you to pray here at the end of our study today. Dear Lord God, thank you so much for the victory that you grant us in Christ. Thank you so much for the Bible that reveals so much about this war behind all wars that we are fighting every single minute of our life. Lord, it's easy to fall. There's so much temptation. There are so many obstacles on every side that, Father, sometimes we fall and don't even notice it. But I ask you to reveal these things to us. Open our eyes, Lord, and allow us to be courageous soldiers in your army. Lord, the, the Bible describes you as the Lord of hosts. And I ask you to please lead us as the general that you are. Bless all those that are at home watching this and allow them to understand this war and to wage the good battle, to fight the good fight. Come soon, Lord Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen. And be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want. And most important, to share it with others.